boy, there's so many places we can, we can go. Um, but just as a point of privilege, as someone obsessed with media, and since you're the one who brought uh, Mr. Zuckerberg back on stage, um, I'm, of the things that are affecting those finely tuned settings, what weight do you give what it does to community if among the things that we are losing is a sense of shared fact? And, I, and I'd, I'd be curious from both of you about the, the cultural and psychological reasons why um, people believe fake news, why the undermine of effect has, has actually happened so quickly and been so effective. Yeah, no, I'd, uh, actually I'd be glad to start off, start off on that. Uh, um, so fake news, so there's the recent study that came out um, out of MIT and other, uh, and other places that sure the Russian bots and those sorts of things, they can put they can put bad stuff into the e media ecosystem, but we hate each other so much we'll believe anything. It's really us. We're the ones who are so anxious to, sp to believe the worst and spread it. Um, so the way I look at it, if you look at the graphs of rising cross-partisan hatred, which have been going up steadily since the 90s, since the late 90s, um, the more we hate each other, the more we'll believe anything. So, so we had that pre-existing problem before social media. Um, cable TV actually was a boon to that, but then social media is much more powerful than cable TV at narrow casting reasons to be outraged. So it's both uh, force feeding us huge amounts of outrage, but it's also really, really good at normative threat. What, what is shown, and here there is a big asymmetry, obviously right wing, well, right wing news is different from left wing news. Uh, um, but. Uh, it's a book by uh, Sarah Sobieraj, The Outrage Industry. Right-wing news is very, very good at feeding. It's really normative threat after normative threat. Things are coming apart, and it's their fault. So yeah, it's hyperactivating the, the authoritarian button as well as fomenting the mutual distrust and hatred. I think, uh, I mean, when I see all that, I think back to the stuff I very briefly discussed about tribal psychology and social learning. So we can show in experiments with very young kids that we're really geared up to take information from those who match our dialect or share our ethnic markers and other cues that, that suggest self-similarity. And I mean, the, the wrong assumption is to assume that we're kind of rational information processors. We have to decide what to believe in the world, you know? Are there invisible beings? Uh, will this detoxify my food? There's all these things that we have to take because, you know, humans, we, we depend on this cumulative body of information which we can't check for ourselves. So a lot of our mental adaptations are figuring out who to believe. And so the, you know, things like Facebook really allow us to connect with all these people that, that we, we kind of were more inclined to believe than these other people. And so that creates echo chambers and all that kind of stuff. So it, um, it, it feels at time to listen to you like we're, we're running the most enormous and consequential experiment on ourselves right now because of introducing not just new technologies, which are forever introduced, but, but in this case, very powerful technologies that are, that are so widely adopted so quickly. You know, you've got two billion people on Facebook, and if you look at all social platforms, you have, you have a new way of communicating, a new way of connecting, a new way of creating communities, and it can be very, have very powerful positive forces in that. But that came upon us so quickly that it feels as though our norms, our moral systems, and certainly our institutions and regulatory systems are just nowhere close to being able to cope with the implications. Yeah. What, what has to happen, quite apart from lawmakers sitting and interrogating technology leaders and not yeah, even I mean, knowing what to ask, um, <laughs> how do you see this, this playing out, given that the stakes as everything that you're pointing to are so high? Yeah, I mean, I don't have any, any hopeful thoughts. Uh, other than, I mean, the usual way that this stuff gets sorted out is by competition amongst groups. So the degree to which people uh, begin to make very deliberate choices about who they connect with and who they attend to and where they get that information, if that leads to greater success, then nor better norms can spread. But um, it's, it's far from clear whether that will happen at this point. Yeah. And uh, I would add, a lot of people compare the current situation to the, uh, the introduction of junk food. And we've learned, you know, uh, we have the long evolutionary history for finding sweet and fat, and then suddenly it's put on, you know, you, you can't walk 10 feet practically without finding packages of sweet and fat. Um, and for a while, the obesity rates went up and up and up. And so the hopeful story is that I, I think last year, for the first time in America, the obesity rate actually might have come down a tiny bit. So maybe we're turning the corner. It, you know, about five or seven decades, however long you want to count it. It took us, you know, many decades to kind of get used to living with this. And maybe the same will happen with social media. 
I don't think so, because um, with at least the junk food, at least there's self-interest, there's so we're sort of like all aligned in saying we need to learn self-control. But with the social media, it's not like people are going to say, hey, you know, fellow Democrats, stop believing all that stuff because it's making us crazy. And in the long run, it's going to hurt our electoral success. Like, no, that's not going to happen. Um, it, it feels so compelling that the other side is so evil that it's going to be very hard to talk people out of believing what they see. Is, there a, is the other side of that what you do see of, of simply the fact that, that so many people are spending so much of their time in an information environment, you know, consuming media of various forms, whether it's coming from their friends or whether it's coming from you know wherever, that that actually um, that too is rewiring our relationships, our institutions, how we think about each other, how how our societies work, simply because we're always on. Is there? Do you see? How do how do you how do you see systems adjusting to? To that fact, or potentially taking advantage. Well, I, I mean, I like the junk food example, though, because it could be at some point there's a pushback and people begin to, to disengage or be much more selective about their use of uh, connecting. And yeah, if it would be great to see the next generation, you know, the kids who are now in you know in preschool, um, at, at a certain point, because so so one thing that I think many people in this room probably don't know is that the suicide rate for adolescent girls in this country is nearly doubled in the last seven or eight years. Um, the rate of self-cutting, hospital admissions, anxiety, depression is skyrocketing for girls. It's up a little bit for boys, but it's skyrocketing for girls. So at a certain point, we might find, um, and, and they're, they're, many of them feel they're caught in a call-out culture. They, when I speak at universities around the country and I describe call-out culture, I say, you know, how, how many of you experience this as happening at your university? All hands go up. Everybody is caught in this. Um, we might find some future generation saying, we, I can't stand this. I'm not going to be on any of these. But that's kind of a long shot. John, I'm embarrassed to say, what's call-out culture? Oh, um, where I could, what, what you, whatever you just said, I can somehow interpret it as being racist, sexist, oh. homophobic, whatever. I call you out for it, and then others pile on. So and it's not just, I mean, that's, that's one. I mean, obviously, there's call-out culture from both sides. But, but um, people are afraid to speak. And this is what's happening on college campuses, too. And what are the implications of that? You referred in your remarks to a kind of academic self-censorship when it comes to creative problem solving, to really drilling into potential solutions and weighing their, their attributes. How, how concerned are you about the self-imposed limitations? I would say that it potentially cripples the social sciences at the time when we need them most. Um, we all suffer from the confirmation bias. We all think we're right. We all try to prove the hypotheses that we prefer, and those hypotheses tend to align with our ideological preferences. That would all be fine if there were people on the other side who would argue against you and find information against you. And in most of the social sciences, it used to just be two or three to one, left to right. Um, but that was in the 1990s. Um, I, I co-founded an organization called Heterodox Academy, which advocates for the need for viewpoint diversity in the academy. And you can go to our site. You can look at the graphs. Um, it's, it's, it's in, my, in my field, psychology, it went from uh, four to one, left, right, in the 90s, to 17 to one now. There's only one, and he's a very nice guy, and we should <laughs> listen to him. Um, so what I'm saying is that um, for academic research to work, the worst possible arrangement is where everybody shares the same confirmation bias. And then, believe it or not, they confirm what they want to believe. It only works, that's the magic of a university, is you have institutionalized disconfirmation. And we don't have that in the social sciences, except economics. Economics is four to one, left to right. So they still have some diversity. So it seems one way to bring diversity into all these conversations is exactly what Jem is about, where you're bringing diverse disciplines, fields of study, fields of experience into looking at, at development challenges. And so, and both of you are, are models of pulling into your thinking everything from you know, biology or neuroscience to, to religion and psychology and ethics. And so I'm wondering if you have any advice for the economists in the room particularly about how they might incorporate um, field, the other fields of study, particularly evolutionary biology, but other fields into, into their work. I'd like to just wait. Before we go into the disciplinary thing, I'd just like to ask, how many of you, given the descriptions I gave, how many of you would say you're a nationalist? Raise your hand high if you'd call yourself a nationalist. OK. It's a bit of a trick question, because it's very embarrassing. There probably are three or four, but, <laughs> but there's only, only one who had the guts to raise his hand part way. Um, 
there probably is not a lot of political diversity in the room. Uh, discipline, Cross-disciplinary diversity is good. I mean, we use different methods, but we actually use them to come to the same conclusion, typically. Or at least there's the risk of that. Um, so I say I'm more optimistic than John about the academy. Please. Make, make us ahead. feel better. Cause feel better. Well, I guess I feel like you know, there's a bunch of people who are just trying to figure out the right answer. And they follow the trail where it goes. And sometimes you find things that confirm what you believe, and sometimes you don't. Um, on some topics, but on other topics, at least people report to me, um, and students say that they, they wanted to challenge something, but they just didn't dare. Now, I, I, on Harvard's campus, I teach a course on human nature where we deal with sex differences and war. And yeah, we've talked about this. I'm thinking your yes. days are numbered. <laughs> okay. We'll see. Teaching it this fall, so. Um, I'm, both of you touched on the role that religion has played in all, all of the evolution of these institutions of, of society, and I'm wondering what you see happening right now as we're seeing in many parts of the world, and certainly here, a decline in the power of institutional religious forces, simultaneous to a, a rise in spirituality and an interest in religious, broadly defined spiritual ideas, and, and what are the implications of that? Yeah, I mean, traditionally, religion has, has created this kind of social bonding and glue, but uh, one of the big things that destroys traditional religions is uh, effective social safety nets and state religions. Mm -hmm. And both of those predict uh, having, having uh, well, they predict people turning to spirituality. It's not like people um, change that much, although they don't, they don't sort of engage in these kind of communal rituals and, and supernatural <coughs> beliefs that bond communities together. So that means just religion becomes less of a source of glue. And people have their own unique individual uh, supernatural beliefs. Well, yeah, so, but organized religions were a temporary thing. I mean, they just kind of, you know, we had them just like, what, a few thousand years. Um, and then we're back, but human nature <clears throat> hasn't really changed much in those years. So we still have the kind of, an, the, the preparedness for these animistic religions. And if you, and, and so I think what we're seeing is a kind of political activity. I think politics is taking the place of religion for a lot of young people. And we're seeing forms of political activity that are quasi-religious. Um, and so, you know, if you look at like protests on campus, I mean, like the, like the shout down of Charles Murray, if you look at the videotape of it, I mean, it's a religious revival meeting. They're chanting in unison, they're swaying. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, human religious nature will be expressed. It's just a question of whether it's going to be brought into a large organized religion or whether it's going to be in things that are not organized in that way and that are more unpredictable. You, you talk about how morality binds and blinds. Are there moral systems that bind but don't blind? Bind, but what don't blind. And does capitalism? Oh, yeah. yeah, I think that um, uh, to the extent, so uh, an interesting finding in social psychology is that if you divide people up into teams and you make them compete, you get a lot of in-group love, but you don't necessarily get much out-group hate. So they're not, they're, um, so there are forms of, there are ways you can bring people together that don't make them hate the other side or, or say, you know, think us versus them. And so, you know, like Quakers, there, there are a variety of Christian sects that are very loving and, and open, and, and um, uh, whereas there are more fundamentalist sects of every religion that are much more about us versus them, good versus evil, Manichaean ways of thinking. So I think we're groupish, but there are some forms of groupishness that are quite compatible with living in a diverse secular democracy, and there are others that are not so compatible. So um, just to build on, I mean, so there's now these large-scale studies taking advantage of natural experiments. For example, in the U.S., the banking sector was deregulated throughout the 1970s and early 1980s, and this was done at different times in different states. So this energized, well, it, it, it made uh, capital much more available to start businesses. There were more businesses started, so there was more competition. And this led to an increase in trust, which continued over 16 mm. years in different US states. And it's basically the psychology experiment, but being played out at different times in different states. Um, this is research by, by Patrick Francois, who's an economist. Uh, in Germany, tracking people through time on a panel, when they moved from a less competitive industry to a more competitive industry, their trust went up. S more competitive industries have higher trust because you have to interact with strangers in your company in order oh, to compete wow. more effectively. So it, 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 it favors precisely those norms which lead to this kind of impartiality and cooperation with strangers and whatnot. So. Um, I love your acronym of the, the Western Educated Industrialized Democratic societies. Um, and my understanding is that some of what we may consider universal values and norms, you would say that's because most of the study has been done 
right. on weird populations. Right. So the, the, the numbers that we had as of a few years ago were 96% of psychological experiments are done with uh, Western populations. 70% are done just with American populations, and most of those are with undergraduates. Uh, so our, our knowledge of the kind of the world globally, psychologically, is, is really narrow. So what do us weirdos need to be learning from non-weird countries? Then how, what would that look like? Well, uh, I mean, the, the claim is just the psychological. I mean, the first thing would be to recognize that there's lots of different ways to seeing the world. So something very basic like uh, there's an illusion called the Muller liar illusion. And it's this one with the line with the two arrows either in or out. And that's actually highest in... in uh, societies with carpentered corners, but if you go to hunter-gatherers, they don't see the illusion. So that's a basic perceptual phenomenon. Um, there's a whole range of tasks like that which vary across societies. Something like l reading. So, um, you know, there was very little reading in the world. Less than 10% of any population was literate until about 1600. So Protestant Reformation hits 1517. Literacy is crucial to Protestantism that spreads throughout Europe. More and more people get reading. You get a thicker corpus callosum, you get longer verbal memory, and you get specialized circuitry in one part of your brain. So you actually get or organic changes, so non-genetic changes in your brain due to literacy. That's just a cultural practice. So I have a final challenge to both of you, and then I want to throw, throw it open to your questions. But you know, the obvious question for our purposes is how do we facilitate cooperation um, among diverse groups that don't share beliefs or common worldviews and preferences? Uh, I'm happy to. Okay, much you, you go. Well, I was going to, I mean, so the, there's, the, I mean, I think there's still a lot to be said about the old handbook, which is that, um, you know, if you want to, if you want to use, if you're, if what we're doing is building nation states, which there, I mean, there's no question about whether the, the best form is a nation state, but, you know, um, you want to have a shared language, right? So uh, common language, that's, a, that's an ethnic cue. Um, if, you, if you have different opinions, figure out whatever it is you have that's the same and make a big deal about the sameness because you want to create this sense so this that is we, we do share some beliefs. You know? right. um, so those are my two thoughts. Yeah. No, that's right. I think approaching this as a social psychologist where you, you, you have to start from the view that it's, it's effortless to divide people. There's all kinds of research on minimal groups. If you point out a trivial difference, you know, you overestimated dots on a page, you underestimated, people will divide and trust the people more that are uh, on their side. So given that we are basically tribal primates who have the capacity to work productively together, if the conditions are right, we should really try to get those conditions right. So emphasizing similarity, emphasizing what we have in common. Um, broadly speaking, having an assimilationist approach to immigration, I think, is probably a good idea. Um, uh, let's see, there's one or, two, uh, one or two other things. Oh, also looking to minimize, so minimize visible differences. That, and visible doesn't mean skin color. It, pe what people care about isn't skin color, it's behavior. And so to the extent that, again, I don't know a lot about the Canadian system, but um, if you have, if, if immigrants are just as likely, or more like, as I understand it, immigrants are more likely to have PhDs than native-born Canadians, um, so uh, if, you know, if, if having an accent is, 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 if anything, a sign that you're more educated, well, that's good. I mean, people aren't, people aren't going to dislike you just because you have different skin color. Um, prejudice tends to be more about judgments of behavior and values than simple physical differences. So they do these social psychology experiments where they vary skin color, so this is done in the U.S., black, white, and also accents. And the, the accent is what carries the day. Yeah. Hmm. That's right. It's what you, can, what you would guess about what that person is going to be like, again, with an eye towards cooperation and trust. We're always trying to size up. Is this someone I want to trust and work with? Yes, sir. Jonathan, I, I love the book, uh, Right This Mind. Thank you. And, and, and I thought you wrote it for the purpose of trying to see if a dialogue could be established between the right and the left. But I, I, it's been a few years since you wrote it. So the, your, your modern pessimism is, is due to, the, uh, to your experience? Yes. I, um, so I, originally, I started writing the book uh, in 2006. I had the idea uh, because I wanted to help the Democrats win. Because I, I couldn't stand it that George W. Bush won twice. And I thought the Republicans were doing a better job speaking to American values than the Democrats. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I started writing the book. Along the way, I discovered that by actually reading conservatives, I actually felt I began to see a lot more things about society and morality and psychology that I just had never been exposed to. And so I, I really found value in 
in talking to people who had different values than me as a social scientist. Um, so I wrote the book to try to basically give that experience and, and encourage people to talk to people uh, who are different and, and to sort of sound the alarm about how we need, we need each other. We need each other uh, to challenge each other and to, to make ourselves smarter. Um, and since, since I wrote the book, things have gotten so vastly much worse um, in terms of the levels of trust and the, the role of technology. So I am, I am very pessimistic about the next 10 or 20 years in political life in this country. You know, 100 years from now, Steve Pinker's probably right, things are going to be a lot better. But I don't see how we get from here to there. Probably we're going to, but I don't see it now. We can ask him about that yep. tomorrow. Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kishore Mabubani. I'm from the National University of Singapore. And I hope you'll forgive this provocative comment. Uh, a lot of the perspectives you've been given here have been sort of Western perspectives that reflect the views, the current mood, the current pessimism of what I call 12% of the world's population. But that's 88% that's outside. And if I just give you three countries as examples, China, 1.4 billion people, India, 1.3 billion people, Southeast Asia, 650 million people, that's almost half the world's population. You're certainly getting a trend, for example, towards greater optimism. Yes. Uh, in fact, all the surveys will show you that the young people are becoming more and more optimistic. You're certainly getting a search towards greater integration with the world, greater globalization, a greater desire to integrate with the rest of the world. The number of Chinese students studying in North America is now about 300,000 Chinese students come to study in American universities as a sort of a positive statement. And at the same time, 120 million Chinese are traveling overseas every year freely and returning to China freely. So the chemistry of the globe depends a lot on where you're sitting, you know. So I, I would say I'd be very careful about extrapolating the Western condition uh, to the rest of the world. So um, you're right as a description of what is happening now. Uh, and it certainly is the case that we can't know what's going to happen in 20 or 30 years. But we can make some guesses. And one possible guess is on that World Values Graph survey, um, the Asian countries are moving up. They're following the same trajectory in some ways, but much, much faster than what happened in Europe. Um, I spent a semester in Asia in 2015. And as, as, you know, as one Korean professor said to me, he went through the, you know, the way Koreans born in the 70s were different from those in the 80s. And he said, and today, my students today, I don't know who they are. They're not Korean. Um, they had values that were so different from his generation. So we are seeing generational change in the direction predicted by the World Values Survey. Um, so one prediction, I'm not confident in this, but I'll make the prediction. Take all those groups you're talking about and how good things are going, and they're on the upper trajectory. Their children or grandchildren are going to be facing these problems. That would be my prediction. That Now, if they keep their authoritarian capitalism, maybe they'll avoid it. But if they go the way that most of us hope they'll go, which is democratic capitalism, this could be their fate. That's what I want to at least warn against. Yes, ma'am. question about nationalism and the graph you showed us. So you meet lots of people who claim to be globalists, um, and the, the words sound like they really care about people, but that's because they, you know, I'll give you an example. So you get lots of people who committed to sort of helping world poverty, and they work for an NGO, and they come to South Africa, and it's very easy for them to do that in another country. Mm -hmm. But if they were threatened just a little bit in terms of their lifestyle and their entitlements back home, mm -hmm. they would have very different views. So I think what people say about, oh, I really don't care, you know, I care about everyone in the world. I don't believe them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when you ask your question of us, which is a loaded question yeah. um, about, you know, are you a nationalist? I don't know what you mean exactly. So I want my country to develop, and I don't really, I want to do that first before I think about the rest of the continent mm -hmm. and their reasons why. And that's very different from are you a globalist, aren't you, what does this mean? So I really don't, I don't buy that particular angle that you're talking about, and I do think it's a very Western, very American perspective you're putting across here that um, needs some 
sort of you need some ex you need to be right. get out and be mugged by the rest of the world right. it seems well, once, to me okay but w once again I, I i would say it's not an american thing it's a thing thought by people in the upper right corner of that graph and so many people in scandinavia you know where they uh, in sweden they think of themselves as the moral superpower um, so I think it's a product of these, uh, of what, of the uh, that kind of thinking, that kind of um, post-materialist thinking. So um, it, it's the way of thinking of people who are who get prestige from showing what their values are. So I would agree with you that the the love and concern for people far away may not be genuine, but they are in a prestige structure such that showing that they care about those people is what is what is is what makes them impressive to the people around them, the people they want to signal to. You know, I just wanted to, actually, I have the um, focus has been on governments and societies, yet there's a very powerful form that one can argue evolved after the Industrial Revolution, and that's the corporate form. And at this point, I think the corporate form has come back to life. Two wars are behind us, two great wars are behind us. Right now, U.S. corporations income is $2 trillion. That's equivalent to India's total GDP. Corporate cash in the United States is between $2 trillion and $3 trillion. And looking to the future, one can argue uh, that there might be a scenario where instead of corporations supporting governments, governments are really subservient to the corporations. And here is Facebook in a matter of 15 years mm -hmm. has connected 2 billion people. And here is Google who dominates everybody. Mm -hmm. And these are just two corporations. Mm -hmm. And there is a big difference between a government which primarily subscribes to democratic values, corporations which don't. Right. And so if the corporate form evolves even more rapidly, we could be looking at a society where the corporations do the connection, corporations do the management of people, corporations do the distribution of resources. And that's a very different scenario than we're in today. Do you agree with that? <laughs> Although it has parallels in European history. So there were these city-states that were run by merchants that began to emerge in the 11th century. Mm. And it's from, that's actually where the first uh, democratic assemblies began to spread. Mm. Did, did they have authority over kings and nobles? Could they, or, or was there well, still so there's some variability? Political? So in some cases, kings and nobles would grant them a charter, which would give them certain rights and privileges, so they could do trade, and then the, they take some of the revenue. Or in some cases, they were just free cities. Okay, but I, I would agree that's a, you know if you, if you remember the movie Avatar, it was about that kind of future where the you know the U.S. Marines basically work for whatever global mega corporation it was called, um, and uh, I you know I do think um, I do think that nation states are sort of the largest unit you can scale up that still works on these tribal sentiments. And some uh, alternatives, like corporate or, or whatever else there is, there, there could be some viable forms. They could be quite toxic. But I think they will not draw on, they will not be based on people's tribal sentiments. I think they will not be perceived as legitimate. 